Welcome to the Well Woman Show, where we interview women executives, leaders, and entrepreneurs. And you're listening to the Well Woman Show, where motivated women achieve fulfillment and well being. You're listening to the Well Woman Show. Take time for myself by coming to things like Well Woman Drinks, to be accepting of myself no matter what. Step away from judgment as much as possible. You're listening to The Well Women Show. Just, you're going to be in for a good ride. I don't regret anything. Everything I've ever done, I've learned from it, one way or another, good or bad. Being a little bit selfish for yourself, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first and then give what's left. I'm a woman. I would prefer to, to tell my own story. My story, though it's very personal, is universal. You're listening to The Well Woman Show. And now your host, Giovanna Rossi. Hi, Giovanna Rossi here, and welcome to another episode of The Well Woman Show, where I interview women leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs about their lives and their road to becoming and being who they are today. Do you ever find yourself overwhelmed with your responsibilities, and it seems like you'll never get it all done? Well, you're not alone. We all need to remember to use our superpowers, the ones we already have but don't use all the time and take advice and wisdom from one another. Towards the end of the show, in a segment called Superpowers for Success, I ask my guest about her superpowers, and the answers will give you the strength, perspective, and power to keep on being the well woman you are. I'm so happy you're here, so thanks for tuning in. The Well Woman Show is sponsored by Better Money Decisions, headed by two awesome women, Kate and Lorraine, who put your interests first when it comes to your money. They make sure your plan and your investments are tailored just for you. No financial jargon, no Wall Street double talk. Go to bettermoneydecisions.com slash wellwoman to get their new book for free. Today's topic is how to turn your passion into a social enterprise. And hopefully by the end of the show, you'll be inspired to pursue your passion, have the knowledge and power to connect to leaders and mentors who can help you, and stay focused on striving for balance between work and life. My guest today is Abigail Lannan eves a certified nurse midwife and executive director and founder of Dada Luce Birth and Health Center. In this episode, Abigail and I talk about how she decided to start a birth center, how she overcomes self-doubt and fear, and why it's important to strive for balance between work and life. Talking about her business, Abigail Lennon eves says, Albuquerque is an important place to have a birth center because we need a middle ground for women to have their babies. And she describes her journey to balancing her work and life. The free giveaway today is my free resources for starting your business. I love this giveaway because it's a quick guide to resources and networks to grow your own business. Download it for free at wellwomanlife.com slash 067 show. Now to my interview with Abigail. I'm speaking with Abigail Lannan eves today. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Abigail, I want to start by you telling our listeners what you do and how you help women's lives. So I am a certified nurse midwife and I'm the executive director at Dada Luce Birth and Health Center. Um, We take care of women through the prenatal period for labor and birth, the postpartum period, and we take care of their babies. We also take care of women um, during preconception counseling and for annual exams. And we are the only a freestanding birth center in all of Albuquerque and in most of the state, and certainly in the northern part of the state. So we're a place where women can come have out-of-hospital birth. Um, that's an alternative to hospital birth. I, of course, have a personal uh, experience with you and at Dada Luz because I had my second baby here. And it's just such a beautiful space for women to come and have their care and and to start and grow their families. Can you talk about that about your impact in the community and and the women that you've served i think albuquerque is a really important place to have a birthing center and i've thought that for many years well before we opened Uh, i worked in a hospital for about six years locally and was very familiar with our home birth community and felt like we needed a middle ground place for women to have their babies and um, that has definitely been true. And I think I think the main thing is the community that we've created, this huge, vast network of women and families who have been able to come to the center for some of their care or all of their care and then reach out to other women that they know and say, there's this other option for you, even if you can't have your baby there 
There are other things that the birth center can offer, including support groups and classes. And I think the most important part of what we do in that community is trying to normalize birth again and trying to get women and their families to understand that they can have control over their care and that their partnerships in their care, they don't need to be told what to do. Talk a little bit more about what you mean by normalizing birth. So I believe in our country, we've medicalized birth significantly, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, women's bodies are designed to have babies, not by certainly not the only thing that they're designed to do, but our bodies uh, were made to, ha- to do this process. And for most women, it's a normal process. And with good prenatal care and healthy lifestyle habits, most women go on to have very normal deliveries and don't need all the interventions that often happen in a hospital setting. So when we talk about normalizing birth, we talk about having women come back to into their bodies and own their birth and be a part of their birth instead of just be a bystander, which I think often happens in a hospital setting where they're told this is how it's going to be done. Maybe their doctor tells them this is how we're going to do it. And they feel like they don't have a choice or they think they don't have a choice. And we are saying, no, you do have a choice. And we're trying to get women to honor that and, and want to have a normal birth. And Abigail, how did you get into this field? You've been a midwife for many years. Why, why did you want to continue in this and start your own business doing it? From a very young age, I was very in tune with natural birth. And I think it was because of my mother's birth stories of my brother and I. And I was just keenly aware of this really powerful thing that women were able to do. And it chose me, midwifery chose me. There was no way around it. And as I went through nursing school and then midwifery school and I started attending births and then learned about birthing centers, I realized very quickly that for me, being in an out of hospital setting where I could really support women in that birthing process was the most important thing for me professionally. I knew that was going to feed my soul. And I feel like if I was called to a profession, then to honor that calling was to really be with women, which is what midwife means, to really be with them at the time of their birth and not just their birth, but through all of their care, really get to know them and be a part of their, their life, not just that moment. And why was it important to you to start a business running a, a birth center and particularly in Albuquerque? Well, that's an excellent question. I guess early on in midwifery school, it just was obvious to me that it was the missing piece in Albuquerque and in some ways in New Mexico. Um, midwives deliver lots of babies here in New Mexico. We have the highest rate of midwifery attended birth in the country. Um, home birth is actually fairly popular in New Mexico. It's paid by Medicaid, so it's recognized as an option for women. And this, again, middle ground that a birth center offers was missing and had been missing in Albuquerque for a long time. I'm born and raised here in Albuquerque. My family is here. My roots are here. My foundation is here. So going away never really made sense to me. And it just felt like the right place to start a birthing center At the time that I thought this is really important, I thought after meeting so many women in the hospital who would say to me, well, I was too scared to have a home birth, so I really didn't have any other option. I thought, okay, they need that other option. Yeah, it's definitely a middle ground though, isn't it? It, It's it's definitely not a home birth because you're not at your home. Um, And it's very different from a hospital setting. And so when you started thinking, I'm going to have this birth center, what resources or networks were in place Mm -hmm. in New Mexico or in Albuquerque that supported your decision? All the resources that we used, we used the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, um, Jean Block. I went to many of her 
fundraising and um, grant writing and how to build successful boards. I tried to attend every single nonprofit workshop, talk, you know, anything I could get my hands into because I don't have a business degree. And locally, I did speak with other executive directors of other nonprofits um, to try to understand that component of the business. I certainly had a very wide network of support through other midwives, nurse midwives and licensed midwives in the community, as well as some um, obstetricians and family practice physicians who were very supportive of opening an out-of-hospital birthing center. And did some of the nonprofit directors that you talked to uh, turn out to be sort of long-term relationships or mentors that you continue to go to when you need questions answered? On occasion, I have to admit some of them are, you know, pretty high profile people and I still get very nervous around them sometimes. Um, and I'll, and in, in some ways what we do here is very different than other nonprofits because we, a good portion of our revenue comes from our services. So we take insurance and, you know, people pay for their care. And then we also fundraise and get donations and write grants. Whereas so many nonprofits, that's the majority of what they do. They don't get money for their services because their services are often free or um, for certain populations. And so that is a very different piece of what we do. But when I have other looming questions and certainly with grant writing, um, fundraising, I have, I still reach out to those other people in the community. So one of the things I've heard a lot about New Mexico and about Albuquerque and that I've experienced is that it is actually pretty easy to reach out to those high profile leaders and um, even policymakers. Was that your experience? It was. Once I got the nerve to do it and um, started reaching out, it became much easier. And you, I guess I'm kind of one of those people that is kind of easily, I don't know if the right word is starstruck, and not that our politicians are like celebrities, but they feel like they have a lot of power. And I think that's actually intimidating for me. And once I realized that really we're all just people and most people are really nice and want to talk to you and in general are interested in what you're doing, that they will, they'll listen. And when it comes to birth, everybody has experience with birth in some way or another. And when you start talking about birth and we start talking about the safety of birth and allowing women to have a choice of where to birth their babies, that reaches into lots of different dimensions for people. And they're oftentimes really open to having that conversation. Do you have a network of mentors that you uh, work with or are you a mentor yourself? I do have a network that's a little more national with our um, national association, um, the American Association of Birth Centers. And we have a national commission that accreditates the birth center um, locally, there are some others in the state that we work with. Um, we have a birth center coalition that we work with. And in terms of other nonprofits, there are people I can reach out to. I don't know that I have a really great network. I don't know if that's the term I would use, but I'm not afraid to reach out. Would you consider yourself a social entrepreneur? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's part of what I'm doing. <laughs> You're so modest. I mean, you're such a leader in this area in New Mexico. And I think a lot of people would really benefit from hearing your story of starting this uh, nonprofit. So talk a little bit about the classes you took at the Center for Nonprofit Excellence and how those that that information impacted you early on. Wow. Um, I took, like I said, everything I could kind of get my hands on. So how to write a business plan, how to write a budget, um, again, how to build a board, strategic planning, those sorts of things. Uh, it feels like a whole lifetime ago. It was hard at the time when I was taking them to really figure out how to actually implement them. And I think that over time, you know, those things have settled into my brain and it's helped me to be a better businesswoman and a better leader. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll, something will come up and I'll think back, oh, I remember I took that workshop on this or that, and they said 
to do this thing and I'll find my notes. I still have notes from all of those and I'll go back and I'll find them. All of those little resources I think are really, really important. Even if you have a business license or not a business license, but a business degree, um, I just think you can't ever stop learning and running a business is hard. It's really hard work and every little piece of information, every little resource is so important. In terms of being a resource for women, Abigail, can you also talk about how the birth center is a resource for their families, their partners, their parents? We really want this to be a family-centered place. We encourage our moms to have people with them in birth who are supportive of them and whether that's just their partner or an extended family, we support that. Um, We also have resources for partners and partners um, are sometimes fathers, they're sometimes mothers, um, they're sometimes friends. Not everybody is romantically partnered and we really try to be um, really inclusive of that Recently, we've even started a happy hour for our dads where dads can go and have each other as resources because they have said in our surveys over and over that they would like to to visit with other dads. And I very early on, I realized that the community that's actually created through the classes is probably the most important thing that happens here, that families are connected to other families and they become very close with each other. And we really pride ourselves on being a safe place for all families to come, same-sex families, um, transgender. We accept everybody with open arms here. And it does seem like it might be a little bit intimidating for for men in this space because it's such a powerful women's space, right, for birth. How do you welcome men into the birth center? And do you have like an example of a family where that made a a big difference for them? I think when women take control of their health care or anything in their life for that matter, but particularly their health care, it's something that men are in general a lot more intimidated about. And I think we really... When we sit in a, in a, during one of our visits and we're talking to our clients, we're not just talking to the mom. We're talking to whoever else is in the room. We ask everybody if they have questions. We get to know the dads. And you know we ask them questions like, do you want to catch your own baby? And things that would never have even crossed their mind. And we say things like, this is your birth to both of them. This is not our birth. So whatever you guys want. And we really try to empower men to be with their partners during this time. I could think of a lot of different births, but I think in general when a family has had a hospital birth and then they come here and they have a birth here, and I'm talking more about men because in same-sex couples it doesn't seem to be, there's not such a difference, but men are often in the hospital kind of, they're just not as well-regarded, you know, Everything happens to the mom, to the patient, to the baby. And here we kind of make them be part of that birth process. And we really try to get them to understand that that connection that's happening between them is, it's more powerful than just a few moments of birth. And so when I, you know, when a baby is born, Um, is emerging underwater or on the bed, wherever they're birthing. And I say, I say to usually the dad or any partner, why don't you reach down and grab your baby? And they look at me like, I can do that. Of course you can do that. And being that first person to touch their little child alters them in such a beautiful way. And it, they own their birth just like those mamas do. Can you talk about any specific challenges you've had as a woman being a business owner? That's an interesting question because I work mostly with women. I would say in some ways the hardest part has been the policy work that we've done and working with the insurance payers, which um, I think is a little bit more male dominated. We spent 
really the last six years trying to um, work with the Department of Health to become a licensed birth center and to get licensure and regulations for birth centers. Um, and there were times where it sometimes definitely felt like we weren't being treated like we had a really, um, like we had a good business, like we were doing something important, um, more like we were just being emotional or something. Mm. Abigail, can you describe your leadership style? So I feel really strongly about having an open door policy and about um, having discussions with my staff. I really try not to lead in any sort of authoritarian way. You know, every once in a while I have to say, no, this is how it's going to be. Um, but we all work together. I want to hear everybody's ideas and um, to try to come up with the best way to run the practice or the best way if we have to change guidelines. I want to know what everybody thinks about it, um, whether it's my midwifery staff or my administrative staff or my educators, everybody's voice matters. And I think my staff would say that that is how I lead. I don't think people are afraid to come to me um, and tell me when there are problems. And I think people feel like they do have a voice and that we all share in making this a really wonderful place to work and an even better place to have your care. You know, I think that women all over the country and the world really listening to this show are thinking about their lives and how they can live their lives to the fullest extent and, and have the quality of life that they really want for themselves and their families. So thinking about that, what would you tell women in terms of your uh, birth center here being a resource for women to start and grow their families in a place like New Mexico? I guess I would say that the birth center as a community resource is open to every woman um, and her family. Not everybody can have their baby here because of risk status. There are different reasons that we risk women out, but there are lots of other things that we offer. And even just to get on our website and learn that there are other ways than just this the typical hospital system, even if it's just for your gynecological care, or even if it's just to come and talk about nutrition or to get a mammogram or just a simple pap smear. The main resource is having another person, another woman across from you who listens, who cares, who empathizes, and who wants you to have the best care. And sometimes we're not the ones to give that care but we can refer on to other wonderful providers. And if you can't come to Dadalus, to look for places like ours where there are nurse practitioners and nurse midwives and maybe a little bit different from what you would normally expect to go to. That's great because, you know, on the Well Woman Show, we really want to talk to women about designing their own lives and, and empowering women to make the decisions in their lives that, are, are the best for them and their families and their quality of life. And so for all of the entrepreneurs or, you know, soon to be online business owners, even out there, um, if you're looking for a great place to have a family, have great quality of life, which I also want to talk to you about, you know, New Mexico really is a great place to do that. And to have these supports like the birth center is, is just amazing. And again, I'm a little biased because I have had a personal experience here, but it's just a great place for women and a great resource. Abigail, can you talk a little bit about other things you do in Albuquerque when you're not working? We definitely want to uh, encourage women to find that balance between work and life. We have only just recently, and we, I mean, really, as the I think the whole group of certainly midwives and nurses have I think finally just found a really good balance. Birth centers, I think traditionally are understaffed and have a lot of turnover because it is very hard work. It's hard work physically, um, emotionally, psychologically. We put ourselves so much into this work that we do. And to get to a place where we could find a sustainable number of staff with this finding the right number of women to, who, that we take care of monthly or annually 
and be able to pay our bills. And that's been a really hard equation to find. And birth centers traditionally, um, in many places, close after sometimes two or three years. They're often just not run very well. And I'll be the first to say, I think a lot of midwives are, you know, we're very passionate, but we tend to be compulsive and impulsive and not the greatest business women. From what I can tell, our hearts are in the right place, but it just takes a lot of work to find sustainability. And as the business grew and as I stayed in this work and kind of put my personal life on the line, I understood that sustainability was much more than just the numbers and much more than the staff, but the sustainability of our own hearts and souls in this because people want to stay here. My midwives, my nurses, they want to stay. But when you're forced to choose over and over again, going to an event with your family or being able to go on vacation, eventually the birth center will lose. And finding that balance has been for me, I think probably one of the most important things on the business side and making sure that my staff feel like they have that balance And I get it when you open a business, I think everybody in general, you jump in with two feet, you go all the way under and you're not really sure when you're going to take your next breath. And I think striving for balance and that sort of kind of life sustainability should be our goal. Our goal here is not to, you know, make more and more money. Of course, we want to survive and I want to pay my staff for what they're worth. But I also want people to come to work and feel refreshed when they've had a weekend off or a day off and feel like they can come into a labor and be ready to really be with a woman in that time and not feel so emotionally drained because she hasn't had a day off for three weeks. Well, one of the things I think you did that was really smart early on was you trained another midwife to work with you so that you could have some time off. What do you do with your time off? So I think most of the time I really just want to spend with my family. I definitely felt like they um, were a little left behind in these last few years while we were doing this. So I love to be home. I, I, I love our house. We live in Corrales. Um, we have a pool. I have an eight-year-old son and then a 20 and a 24-year-old who are out of the house. I love being with my family and my husband, Um, We have cats and dogs, but we also love to go out by the river. We love to ski in the winter. We love to hike. We spend a lot of time by our pool in the summertime, and we love to travel. So whenever we can get away, even if it's for a quick weekend, we'll try to do that. Um, But we love to take longer trips. We want to see as many places as we can, and we love to take our kids with us. Uh, My mother is still here. My husband's parents are here. So any chance that we have to just spend time with our family, because that is so precious and you never know when that can change. Mm. So that's the most of what I do. <laughs> do you have a favorite family event in Albuquerque? I would say probably the, my favorite thing to do is go to the growers markets. I love doing that and taking my little one and, you know, having him experience fresh fruits and vegetables and I love the growers market. I have to say downtown because I love running into our families. I love seeing people who have come through the birth center and seeing their children getting older. And it's really touching for me. Okay, Abigail, we're going into the segment called superpowers for success. And so I'm going to ask you a few quick questions here. Before we get started, a quick word from our sponsor. One of the top issues women tell me they struggle with is finances, which is why I want you to call my friends at Better Money Decisions. The company is owned by women, Lorraine L. and Kate Stalter, and they make sure your plan and your investments are tailored just for you. They're fiduciaries and put your interests first. No financial jargon, no Wall Street double talk. Also, they have a gift for Well Woman Show listeners, their free book, Don't Let Your Money Kick the Bucket Before You Do. And it's all about the need to manage your money for a long life expectancy. You can download the entire book at bettermoneydecisions.com slash wellwoman. And you'll also get a free portfolio diagnostic so you can tell if your investments are right for you. Just go to bettermoneydecisions.com slash wellwoman. 
The first one is, what does success in life mean for you? Uh, I think being happy day in and day out with what you do and who you're with and who you're doing it for. My father taught me from a very early age that all he wanted from us was to be happy. And if that was, I don't know, being a police officer or a maintenance person, it didn't matter as long as we were happy. And that was really drilled into me. And so having a profession that chose me, that pulses through my blood, it's really easy for me to be happy. So you've mentioned that a couple of times now that your profession chose you. And for women listening who might be trying to figure out whether they're on their path or they found their purpose, what exactly do you mean? How did that happen? Good question. I, from about the time I was 11 or 12, I knew that I wanted to deliver babies. I wanted to attend birth. And I didn't quite know what that meant, but I knew that women needed people to attend their birth. And then I decided I wanted to be an OBGYN because of Heathcliff Huxtable from The Cosby Show. And he was a very kind and empathetic man um, and very kind to his patients anytime that they had any sort of scene like that on the show. And then my sister had a home birth when I was only 14. I didn't get to attend, but I saw pictures and she told me about her midwife and I just knew. I just knew that's what I'm going to do. And then I learned about there's different pathways to midwifery and then learned about, you know, different places where women can birth. And so when you knew that deep down, did you ever doubt it? And how did you overcome that? I did doubt it. I doubted it early in college. I really struggled with science classes, some of the basic classes, uh, pharmacology, anatomy, and physiology, things that you have to take and have to get a decent grade to go on into nursing school. And it took me three attempts to get into nursing school, and it took having to take classes over. And that was that was really hard. And I definitely questioned whether it was the right path. And looking back, I think there was just some maturity that I needed to go through to actually be ready for nursing school. And there was a period where I doubted it. My first son was born when I was only 20 years old, and I was a single mom. That was very hard, and it was really hard to try to figure out how I was going to go back to school with a young child and how I was going to leave him, how I was going to afford it. And it was only you know a couple months of, I think, you know, working at a local restaurant and waiting tables that I realized this is not what I want. There's this pathway that is calling for me. And it, it just didn't ever feel like an option. There were times of doubt, but it didn't feel like I had a choice in the matter. I just had to do it. And Abigail, when did you know you were really good at what you do? Sometime while I was working at our local, one of the local hospitals, I was there for six years between 2003, 2009. And I remember at some point, maybe three years in that I thought, I'm not green anymore. And that's really cool. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I felt like I was really good at just at being with women and listening to women. And I did something that most hospital midwives don't do is I followed my own clients. So women would come and find me in different clinics because I moved all over the city as I was part time. And I felt like if they were willing to follow me, then I should follow them. And so I would be on call for them at the hospital which is really unheard of in most large practices anymore. And I think being there in those really, in those times for those women, I I realized I'm good at this. I'm a natural at this. And I understand now why it chose me. Describe one personal habit that contributes to your well-being. Exercise. Yeah, I keeping that, that for me is really, really important. I do it for me. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel strong. And I work out a lot of anxieties and concerns and fears while I'm exercising. Okay. What superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? Um, I think for me, just listening to my intuition and it's easy for me to show up every day. I do what I do because it, because I love it. Um, I am who I am 
because I love it. And I, I don't know what else to say. I don't know if that's a superpower, but, um, I definitely think your intuition with women in birth is your superpower. Thank you. What advice would you give yourself, uh, your 25 year old self? Oh, I would say keep on keeping on. You know, if there's something that you know that you love, something you're passionate about, something you feel like you just have to do it, you figure out a way to do it. Okay. And do you identify as a feminist? Absolutely. Yes. The F word now is just seems to be such a, (laughs) seems to be such a dirty word, but um, I believe that I'm a feminist in, in every way. I believe in women making their own choices for themselves in all walks of life, no matter what it is, not just healthcare, but everything that they do and women's rights and women being equal to any man. Absolutely. And last question, what are you reading right now? What's on your nightstand? I am reading About Grace by Anthony Doerr, who wrote um, All the Light We Cannot See. And so moved by him. I got to see him at the Academy um, a few weeks ago. And to listen to somebody talk about their passion and how they came up, how he came up with the idea for that book, this one little spark really resonated with me. And I thought that's how it was for me to start this birth center. And that's how it was for me to get into midwifery. There was a spark. And the more I learned and the more I understood, the more it just exploded and turned into, I guess, a fireball. (laughs) that's a great way to end the show you are a fireball abigail thank you so much and we will link to your website and all of the uh, resources that you mentioned on the show will be in the show notes on the website so thank you so much abigail thank you so much for having me it was really fun that's it for our show today. I've been speaking with Abigail Lannon Eves, executive director and founder of Dada Luce Birth and Health Center. In this episode, Abigail and I talk about what classes she took to get started as a social entrepreneur, how she got the nerve to reach out to policymakers and leaders to help her build her business, and her challenges being a woman and working for birth policy changes. You can get the free resources for starting your business at wellwomanlife.com slash 067 show. Before I sign off, I want to let you know about this year's superpower retreat. It will be October 25th to 27th in New Mexico. So save the date and check out wellwomanlife.com slash retreat for more information. Our monthly live event, Well Woman Drinks, brings women together to share our successes and challenges as women, leaders, moms, aunts, sisters, and all the other roles we carry. If you'd like to attend a Well Woman Drinks near you, or if there isn't one in your city yet and you'd like to start one, email me at info at wellwomanlife.com. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe in iTunes and leave a review. Or you can head to patreon.com slash wellwomanshow to support the show with a monthly contribution. You can also continue the conversation with us in the Well Woman Life community group at wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you were listening today, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for the Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.